My name is Jakub Budkowski and I will be talking about uh, Kubernetes for busy developers. Um, this basically session is about, um, so you will be able to not to be this guy on the picture. So you will understand what you're saying and what Kubernetes is and how to use it. It's not a session for any people who already know Kubernetes and it's using Kubernetes in a daily, um, on a daily basis. My goal for today is just to show the components that we uh, that build Kubernetes and that makes Kubernetes a Kubernetes, and uh, how they can uh, help you uh, on everyday uh, job on every um, in, on every year. Sorry, um, on uh, everyday uh, uh, work that you're doing at, at at the company. But to do it, uh, we need to come back and figure out what exactly Kubernetes is solving, what kind of problem. And to um, know exactly what the Kubernetes is solving, we need to go back to the prehistoric times. Not that far away, but still the computers are in the basement or under the desk where we were used to develop, uh, deploy the application using disks. I still remember in my first job, I was going downstairs to the minus one floor with a diskette and I was installing a new software on the server. So in 2001, um, the web development was quite easy. There was a simple application with simple uh, database, um, nothing special. We didn't truly really care about the user. Um, we, could, we could combine this as two different aspects of architecture. One was the lasagna code, that is copy-paste. So someone wrote a copy functionality, someone wrote, I don't know, a parsing functionality. We're just copying and pasting and building a big spaghetti bolognese sauce application. And then comes the um, monolith. So it's layered monolith based on, on the departments that the companies are usually built. So we had uh, UX, um, we had people from uh, the UI uh, to create the UI. We had a, a lawyer la layers, which is called a business logic. Why lawyers are called the business logic? Who knows? Because if lawyers say you can't do it, that means you can't do it. So they create the logic, especially in the banking system. So if you write the banking system, it's not what functionality the banking is giving you, but what lawyer is giving you. Because lawyers said what's possible, what is not. And at the end, of course, at the base level, there was a data access level, level with databases. The deployment in 2001 was rare. You were going downstairs to the basement with the diskette and were installing this. It was done manually um, on the physical machines in the basement or under, under, under the desk, in one of the companies that I used to work, we had a computer running in the corner of, of the top floor on the open space for the developers, and it was hosting a bank system. And no one was able to, uh, there was like, do not touch, lots of posters and saying, do not touch, do not restart it, because this will make the one of the bank goes down. And it does, it did. It did many times when the electricity were, went down. But it's okay. So we didn't care about the users. We're doing the, uh, the deployments manually, and um, it required the downtime. Usually, what, what we're doing, we're just coming back, uh, coming to our servers, taking off the current version of the software, installing a new one, and there was a downtime two days, three days, because sometimes always something went wrong, and the scaling wasn't easy. If we succeed, we had a conference, dancing, screaming on the on the stage, and having fun. But if we failed, we felt hard. And it was really hard to, to revert back from what we had experienced. That a bit changed in 2006 and 2014. The, uh, the, our architecture started to be bigger and more complex. So instead of one web server, we now have uh, like a, a UI, an API server, and many internal microservices or something like this running inside with the database connected. Each service got, contains its own database, and it's getting complex and bigger which is called Ravoli architecture. And it's like you put the Ravoli and put the sauce over it, connecting, and somehow it works. You never know how, but the complexity, uh, the, the, it can be done, um, the, the deployment, a uh, few times per day. The complexity of the whole solution and the whole deployment rise with nine numbers of elements inside it. And um, we started to stop thinking about the hardware during the, de the deployment, because the hardware right now was in the data center. That's not now a computer in the basement anymore, because we don't have so much money to pay for the electricity bills, except the Bitcoin miners. 
Um, so uh, we 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 just lent, renting the hardware from the data centers. Usually, um, it can be done by by what person? There is a special person with the instruction set who is going with the deployment and reading. Number one, do this. Number two, do this. And of course, without the supervisors, bad things can happen. And it, it, did, but it did happen badly for the uh, Knight's investment that has started to lose five million pounds, uh, dollars per second for 45 minutes. So they went bankrupt in 45 minutes by wrongly done deployment instructions of someone that a manual human error. And of course, the complexity rises, and we, we started to use as the instructions. We started to write the instructions. We started to notice that we are developers. We can write a better code. We can, we can write scripts to do the same things by us. So we started to create the custom tools to, to use the deployment, to deploy the applications. And of course, this was a custom tool for, for this specific solution. So if you had the application with two web servers, we wrote the, uh, the script to deploy only two servers. If you had an application with three servers, then we said, oh, we need to write a new tool. And that was getting complex and complex and heavier and heavier. And if we did succeed, we had a party like 2000 something. But if we failed, we failed really hard. So hard that you basically give up during in the middle of the flight, you just give up. Hit, and that's it. There was no easy way to revert back if if something went wrong and you broke deployment on third server, the whole application could drop. And reverting back from that failure, it's really hard. It's almost impossible. So you just give up. And then 2040 came and the containerization with the Docker shows up. So instead of the web server, we started to use containers. Everyone know, everybody knows what containers are, yes? So basically we use Web application equals a container. We start to use database equal containers, but then it hurt. <laughs> it really hurt. Multiply times, like, ouch. And we're still doing this. And one, uh, in the, uh, I think in the next session, on the serverless, in one hour, there is a session about how to use Kubernetes storage for hosting databases. Yeah. Uh, uh, there is a good, um, the good um, Google post about when to run a database on Kubernetes, slash Kubernetes and call it containers. And whatever you choose, it's like, do you have time and do you have money? If yes, go for it. If you don't have money, don't have time, and don't have uh, um, resources to host it, then don't do the databases on containers. So I'm all against it. But there are the options. There's a really nice diagram, and there's a link. Um, so if you want to read it, it's good to read. And of course, uh, when the containers start to be uh, popular, there is an, a next way of creating the architecture, which is called a pizza-oriented architecture, when the Jeff Bezos said that if you can't feed the team with two pizzas, the, the team is too large. That means in Poland, there's only one student. Yeah. <laughs> but in, in, in the United States, they say that it's five to seven people. I don't know how. I was eating those pizza. No. <laughs> No, okay, but um, what it made, it made this, our simple application, oh, sorry, this one, look like this. Because right now, we have five people working on the smallest part, and everyone says containers are the best, so we're deploying the containers. Everyone's creating the container, and instead of five containers, we have 20 containers. And how to deploy it, how to manage it? What if this container depends on this container? Who, what containers should be started first? how to manage them, how to deploy them. When this container fails, how do we know this? So we started to write tools. <laughs> and of course, with everything, at, with the containers, which is awesome and amazing, you can containerize the application in something like this, and then say, it runs on my container, so it should run on the pr production as well. It helps with the dependencies. It solves lots of problems that we had during the deployment of the application. Like, you, could in, you couldn't install two versions of, of uh, some sort of a web application because they were using two, two different versions of .NET or Java framework and they, they couldn't be installed on the same server. And then you had the problem. Right now, you don't have this problem because you have a container. Container's got these dependencies, bundle it. And of course, with containers, when it fails, it fails. But if you succeed, you are like a Robin Hood shooting through the apple of the little boy standing on the connected to the trees. 
after many fails. <laughs> but it's possible to manage it manually by yourself using the script. Not that amazingly, but it's possible. And then there is a uh, then the Kubernetes comes with the white gloves and stuff like this. But uh, what the Kubernetes is, Kubernetes, if it's the name from the Greek, which is called, uh, which basically means hel helmsman. That's the man who is steering the st the, 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 the sheep. Uh, ship and why it's called like this because I don't know why the docker When they was popularizing the technology that was already there in Linux and stuff uh, Called containers the containers like the in the previous screen This one they decide to use these ones and what the what kubernetes did that it decide so someone needs to manage and deliver them. So you're giving me a log what to do with the container, and I will make sure that this will happen what you describe here. I will deliver that to the point where, uh, from the log. So if, you, if, I'm, if you're saying that the red container with some sort of toys inside should be delivered to the blue port, it will be delivered to the blue port. That's my log, and I will do it. And what basically Kubernetes is, Kubernetes is just orchestration pattern, uh, orchestration platform that helps you deliver the containers in the proper way, in the proper directions, and manage them. That's that's all the buzzwords around this. Of course, there are more details inside it, but that's basically it. And I will go through the, uh, the describing of the some of the features of the Kubernetes. But before, do you know what K8S means? It's Kate. <laughs> it's funny, but it's all right. Uh, honestly, I had uh, when I first saw uh, when I first time when I saw the K eight S. I was trying to read Kates as well because of the skates. It makes sense for me, but it didn't. It means only eight letters between K and S. Kubernetes. It was funny ten years ago, but okay. Um, when you look at the Kubernetes, you can you can have a two points of view or two um, two aspects of the Kubernetes. One is that the Kubernetes is a set of tools that help you deliver what you need in the less effort and less time manner. And on the other hand, you have which are not exclusive, uh, mutually exclusive. So you can look at the Kubernetes as the platform to build a bigger platform. So you can use Kubernetes to create. Um, open uh, FAS platform based on the Kubernetes, or you can use OpenShift based on the Kubernetes, or you can use Kubernetes and say, I have something that is nice to have on the Kubernetes, but Kubernetes is not giving me that functionality. I can extend functionality, uh, Kubernetes to provide that functionality to me. So depending on how you sit and what you want to do, you can, you can look at this differently. But uh, you can, you can, they are not mutually exclusive, so you can still use this and this one. And let's try to convert that into. Who, who knows who is uh, what Kubernetes is and who is using Kubernetes? Uh, so many people. Okay. Um, so how would you convert that into the Kubernetes? Ha. Huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> the small. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right. At the end, maybe there will be some. Um, so the, the smallest uh, possible deployable unit in, in, in Kubernetes, it's called pod. The pod is like our application. So you can host our application inside. It's hosting a container. So it's like a one container. It can host multiple containers. There are different patterns. So we can call it a sidecar, adapter pattern, or whatever else, like ambassador pattern, initialize pattern, work queue pattern, and self-awareness pattern. There are so many patterns. But uh, what's the sidecar? The easiest options of the sidecar is your application write log files. And you don't care about any uh, monitoring system that is outside your application. So you create the sidecar that will read the log file and will push that information into, I don't know, Elasticsearch or uh, what's that, Prometheus or something else. We can do it. And the adapter pattern, it's easy. You have a legacy application, and you can't truly really change the API for it. So you're creating the new sidecar, sidecar, uh, 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 a, new, a new container that basically wraps the old API into the new API. So you don't need to change anything. You just put a proxy in between the user and the, and the, and the main container. 
Um, ambassador pattern is like your, your application, can't, you can't change it, but it has hard-coded value to call DB server. And it's always connecting to the DB server. And how do you do it on, on, on the containerization application? It's really hard. So you put the container on the side that it's called DB server, and it knows how to uh, route the, the, the connection to somewhere else. And what's all, also cool about uh, the, the pod that contains with two props, that comes with two props, one is readiness and one is liveliness. Readiness is the prop that's saying, I'm ready. I can receive the request. So how fast, how, how fast do you start the container in your, in your environment? Who is using containers, Docker or whatever? Somebody, okay. So if you Docker run, how long it takes? To start, it's like this. But your application takes more to load, to load all the dependencies, all the, I don't know, frameworks and um, data. So it's the readiness. Readiness is saying that I can't serve yet a request because I'm preparing and loading my whole environment to run. And the liveliness prop is, are you alive? 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 Are you, oh, it's dead. Kill it. Uh, so basically, that's it. That's the simple explanation of liveliness. So readiness is when you're ready, and, and, and liveliness is hitting you all the time until you say, I'm dead. Finally, you will. And the ports are thermal. Uh, what it means that, <coughs> that uh, uh, they can disappear quite easily, and you don't know when. Almost like this guy. But um, so, uh, you, uh, do you know uh, the petal, uh, the, the pets versus kettle story? Uh, when you have a pet, you name it. You you care for him. When he dies, you sad. When he's happy, you happy. When you have a kettle, you don't care that one cow died, as long as you have twenty cows in your kettle. So um, the pots are treated like cows. So. You can't, there is no guarantee what name the pod will have, what IP address the pod will have. It could disappear in a second and the new one will be created. And something that creates those pods and manages those, those kettle, it's called the replica set. Replica set is all it's doing and all it's responsible for, it's responsible for making sure that X or N, whoever wants to use N or X, instances of your pod exists at the current time. So if you said, I want to have one instance of my application, you will have one pod. If the one pod will, liveliness prop will say, oh, it's dead, it will kill it and create a new one. So it will always be one pod. If you said free, it will be free. What it means for you as the developers, how do you share state? Because you have free instances of your application. What will you do if you have if you are waiting for a message from message queue, which instance will receive this message queue? Who will proceed it? What if all three will proceed it? That's the things that you need to start thinking as the developers. And what the Kubernetes is helping you locally, you can test this. It was, easy, it was, it was not easy to test multiple instances of the application at the one computer a few, few years back. But right now, you can have three instances of your application running on your computer, and you can test what will happen, and if it will work, having in the, in the, in the multi-instance uh, world, which can be really helpful in, in production-ready application. And um, with the replica set, there is one issue. If you have a free pod, how would you access them? Sorry? By service? Yes, the service is there. The, but currently, if you have a free, it's really hard. You don't know the name. The name changed because it could be deleted and started. The IP address, it's not really giving you anything. It's, it's, it's cluster-based. It's local. It's not external visible. So what, what you're doing, you're doing the abstraction that is called service that binds the name and IP address and then groups all of the pods from the replica set to access. So whenever you access the service, it will randomly uh, move you to one of the servers, or one of the applications, sorry, uh, the pods. I'm saying randomly because it's random. Uh, it used to be uh, route Rubin, but currently it's random. So you're hitting the uh, randomly uh, selected pod, unless you have a keep alive set in the, head, uh, in, in the request. If you have keep alive, it will be always hitting the same pod. But if there is no keep alive, so you're doing the curl, it will always go random. 
And the service, there are three types of the service, or even four, five, but the three are based. I uh, will not be talking about them today, uh, but what's change, it's how the application communicates. So you are not communicating application to application any longer. That's something that you need to think about. You're communicating application to service. Because you, this might be a completely different name, completely different address IP. So you need to make sure that when you communicate, you communicate something that you can um, resolve. And the only way to resolve this is by using a DNS. I think this is the best secure option to do it in this case. So your application needs to be able, so you need to be able to inject some configuration to it. And w when we have the deployment and, and uh, when we have a replica set and, and, and services, we can access the application, but how do we still do the deployment? How we force a new version of application to be deployed, released, and what are the options to, to do it? So Kubernetes gives us a deployment uh, resource, and deployment is responsible for making sure that at least one version of application is working. And there are many options to do it. And what it's doing, it's doing it on managing the replica set. So even if I'm telling this right now, you, you, you might notice that there is a pod. The pod is managed by the replica set. So the pod has got a simple job, describe the application. Replica set has got the simplest possible job, manage pod. And now the deployment has got a one simple job, manage replica set. So the, the whole Kubernetes is built like this. So there is one simple resource that is responsible for managing one simple job, and that's it. And um, this helps, if you understand this, it's probably you will be able to understand most of the functionality in the Kubernetes, in OpenShift, and somewhere else. All the products are built on Kubernetes. And with the deployments, we have two built-in two strategies. Uh, rolling deployment and recreate deployment, and there are many more strategies like blue green and canary release. Those, any one of you heard about the deployment strategies before? Okay, cool. Uh, so the, the, let's create. Uh, let's start with the recreate deployment. That is the, the simplest one. We have the application running. We want a new version. Drop the current application. There is a downtime. Let's create a new application. So there is a downtime. With uh, blue green release, which is quite good and quite nice, we require twice as capacity of the servers because we have two applications running. The first, the blue and the green. They are running all together and then we decide to switch one off and change the service to point to the different one. So as you remember, the service is responsible for pointing to the specific application. So blue, green release means basically that we've got two applications running and the service, just we just switch the application and we route the traffic to a completely different application. However, what is note, uh, to, uh, to be uh, no noted here is that when you have two different applications, you probably, as the previously I said, that the, the running database on the Kubernetes is not a good option. So you will have still one database. And now you have two version applications running on production uh, using uh, the same database. So what will you do? There is an option how to do it. You release database before the releasing of the application. So you update the schema before you updating the application. So you make sure that the current release is working with the new schema. And then when you do the new release, you know that everything will be fine. The canary release is that the sum of the people will be using the new functionality and the old people will be using old functionality. And rolling update is like a connection of uh, blue, green, and recreate, which basically says, okay, I will start slowly removing the current version of application, I will start slowly starting a new application. So we have random people will hit different versions of applications at any time. So they can use a new functionality or the old functionality. And over here, the database, this schema is a must. But what we have with Kubernetes and the deployment is that, I'm too far, that finally we can revert and we can stop the deployment. We will no longer hit the wall or the floor so hard that we'll not be able to move. But if something goes wrong, the Kubernetes will say, oh, I will revert to the previous version. And it works so good that in our development environment, twice during one year, we had the application running for three weeks and we didn't notice that it was running on the previous version. So we've released a new one. We didn't have any notifications in the development environment. Who cares about that? 
Um, but it was running on the old one, so the, there was an issue with the deployment, and Kubernetes was so smart that he reverted the, the deployment and uh, restored the previous version that was working. So I was saying, everyone was looking at the Kubernetes, everything works. It's perfect, guys. Why do you say that there is no endpoint? I've deployed it three weeks ago, and it's still working. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, twice. So I hope the third time will, will, will never happen. We need to learn. Um, so deployment basically is a set of deployment, replica set and the pod. So three major resources that we'll be using most of the time in the Kubernetes. The pods are the kettle, it's the application that we are running. Replica set manage the pods and the deployments manage the replica set. And in the rolling update, it looks like this, that we have a deployment revision one and a replica set version one running three pods. We want to install a new revision, then the new revision is deployed of the deployment and replica set or two is starting one pod. Uh, we can configure uh, the, the rolling update. We can have like, uh, they can be only uh, updating by one, by two. We can have, there's only uh, the difference between uh, running and uh, the old version, the new version is one pod or two pods. So we can, we can work how the rolling updates will work. There are parameters to do it. But once the live, uh, readiness and liveliness props answer, okay, everything is okay, we're deleting one of the pods and we are creating a new one in the replica set two. That's the rolling update. And this continues until we have three pods running and the three pods are removed from the replica set one. And then we have the situation like, like this. So we have a previous replica set saved for a security reason if you want to revert back if something went wrong. And the new replica set working here so we can uh, use it and the application is working. So whenever Right now, we will find there is a back in application on the production that we're losing money. What we can do, we can just say roll back. And straight away, we will end up, end up with this. This is what Kubernetes will do out of the box. We don't need to think about this. We don't need to uh, script it. That's, that's the platform that the Kubernetes is giving us. And this is the, f the, the thing that makes the Kubernetes really helpful. And there is one uh, short video that we can also I don't know if it would work. That what we can achieve with the Kubernetes, which is really cool, and I like to show it always, if the internet connection will allow. If not, I will. We're going to do is look at the number of pods in production and see what it looks like when another system comes up on top. So here we'll say, uh, while true, get the pods. Context. So the pods are the, the applications that we deployed. So if you're new to Kubernetes, you can actually use kubectl when you have to. And if you do, it actually does support uh, multiple clusters. Go away, Siri. All right, we see we have one pod running. And since the replica count is not included in my config, we'll do our last bit to see if we can actually have multiple systems interact with the cluster because Kubernetes maintains the cluster state. So we have multiple actors interacting with these configs at the same time. So here we go, we're gonna try this last thing. Demo guys have been on my side so far. Okay, Google, talk to Kubernetes engine. Okay, let's get the test version of Kubernetes engine. Greetings. Scale the Hello World deployment. How many replicas would you like? You crazy, you're gonna break everything. <laughs> 10. Scaling the Hello World deployment to 10 replicas. It's that easy. So you're going on the conference and you're showing up your awesome product. That was pretty dope. Yeah, it was dope. It was dope. Um, and you are on the conference and you're just presenting a new product and there's, I don't know, 3,000 people and you know that 3,000 people will hit your product while you're doing on, on, on the back of the stage. Hey, Siri, <laughs> scale up the Hello World deployment. And it works. It's that easy. Uh, so uh, there are things, um, sorry. 
I know I need to do it manually. <laughs> so uh, after the conversion, our, our solution looks almost like this. There is the same WW application that we can extract from the uh, Kubernetes. It doesn't need to be. There is API management or whatever the gateway to access the APIs. But there is a deployment deployment with replica set one, uh, with a uh, uh, number of replica sets set to one, uh, to three. There are some services. We're talking to the services and databases out of the of the Kubernetes, and every this, everything of this can be applied and achieved by this one command, and that's it. However, there is like a big star over here, the solution yam that, <laughs> that, that, that hides all the complexity of this deployment. However, it's that simple. So uh, uh, it's not really hard, and after that, if you, if you, if you can manage, then you are just a superhero. Uh, shooting the car on the fly and taking up the hostage people out from the car before it will hit the floor. You, you're the best. Um, but like with everything, uh, Kubernetes right now is it's a hype. So everyone is saying use Kubernetes, Kubernetes. It was like I was in one of the project and I, I think it was a banking or something like this. And the guy was, I don't know what we will want to achieve yet, but it needs to be on Kubernetes. I say. No, <laughs> and it needs to be on Kubernetes. I say no. So uh, be, uh, be aware of that. So um, the, uh, the Kuber everyone is saying go on the Kubernetes, like the guy from the beginning, the, the uh, Dilbert uh, manager was saying. Uh, know the limitation and know what the Kubernetes can be used for and when, to, when not to use it. Have you, have you, not, have you, have you seen a Dockerized, Dockerized desktop application on Docker? So you can RDP to it and work like the Windows application or the Linux uh, Windows application on the Docker. Don't do it. And don't use it on the Kubernetes. That's not the way to do it. Why seriously people are doing this? I don't know. So uh, when not to use it? Um, when you write application for mobile application, there's no Kubernetes yet for that. <laughs> but it, there is for the Raspberry Pi. So if you write for the Raspberry Pi, you can deploy that on the Raspberry Pi. Um, desktop application still is not good. Small projects. That's like I have an idea. Let's create. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, my wish list uh, page, and let's host it on Kubernetes. No, don't do it. You will pay a lot of money to do it, and you don't need to do it. You can host it like the static pages for free on GitHub uh, or wherever else. Uh, so uh, find the project that it really can leverage the, the, the whole environment from the Kubernetes. So you will need to scale. You will need the deployment. The complexity is quite bigger than just a simple web application. And um, every exe schedule job uh, application is fine for Kubernetes. Kubernetes contains something called uh, jobs and cron jobs. So you can write the schedule jobs, like once per year, uh, one pence per month, gather all the data from the database and send the pay, pay slips. Um, the API, internal, external API, web application, that's fine. That's everything fine. But hosting static files on Kubernetes, sorry. Don't do it. And don't do the colonizer, tokerizer desktop applications, seriously. Um, and the whole presentation is with stars. I was showing the simplest possible solution for you. It's that simple and it's not that simple. So with everything that goes, at, at least you know what pod is and how this works and where, where this might help you, but it's not that simple that you will have application and you will go straight away. There are te technology specific configuration even for containers. So the Java and .NET currently have an issue that if you run them on container application, deploy it on the, on the Kubernetes cluster, they can think that they have like 100 of gigabytes RAM free for usage, which is not true. You need to properly configure the application and set the proper uh, limitation. And it's not limitation that you set on, in the Docker or uh, Kubernetes, but you need this uh, on the starting up the application in the container. Otherwise, it will treat the whole, there is some issue of reading the, the, the limitation of the RAM and the Docker, Docker free, uh, the dot, .NET 3.0 will try to solve this issue, and Java has got some workarounds already. There are cloud-specific settings, like if you use a specific um, service, uh, then on the Google it will be different configuration than it goes on the Azure, and the different than it goes on the AWS. So it's simple, but it's not that simple. You always need to 
go and look for it. However, if you know what you're looking for, it will be much easier for you to understand the answer and uh, find out what exactly you need to set. So at the end, I'm hopefully you understand the base components of the Kubernetes and how they work and how you can use them on everyday work. You know? Or no? Yes? Do you understand this? No? All right. Um, <laughs> Um, if you are Polish and you want to have uh, more information about the base uh, Kubernetes information, like what's, what's inside and the full, currently I've described it three resources. In this book we've described it around 12 resources and how to set up your local environment for, uh, for developing the application. So if you want, go ahead, Poznań Kubernetes Pal. It's only in Polish, but it might be helpful to start working on your local computer, so at least you can try it in, on, your, on your work machine and then say to your boss, no, Kubernetes is no go. If you, if you are able to say that, that means you understand it. And that was the goal of the application. So if you have any questions, I'm here.